Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Brian McClanahan, and today we're going to talk about the Articles of Confederation and what's often called the Critical Period. Now, uh, Dr. Goodsman is going to address many of the issues that uh, confronted the United States uh, in this period between uh, the uh, War for Independence and the ratification of the Constitution in one of his uh, presentations. And so I'm going to talk about the Articles of Confederation itself and uh, how the government was uh, established uh, at this particular period of time, the framework of government, some of the issues that are going on in the United States, and at least in the way they conceptualize government, uh, because a lot of this stuff, of course, is going to impact the Constitution. And uh, some of the language of the Constitution is lifted directly from the Articles of Confederation. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on here. And I think it's important to understand the background of the Constitution and to uh, understand the, uh, the, parameter of the parameters of the Articles and what the founders considered to be union. Because that idea of union, of course, is the most important component of this uh, Constitution, then later the Articles of Confederation, because that's exactly what we're talking about when we look at constitutional issues, you know, the nature of the Union. Uh, <clears throat> that's the base issue. Uh, how did the founding generation conceptualize Union? How do we conceptualize Union today? Uh, what is this government supposed to do? Do we have a national government or a federal government? And so all these issues, of course, are addressed uh, whether it's at the period of the Articles of Confederation or moving into the Constitution. So let's get started. Um, the Articles of Confederation, of course, was uh, drafted principally by John Dickinson in 1776. It was not formally ratified until 1781 when Maryland ratified the document. And, of course, for it to be official, every state had to ratify the Articles of Confederation. So it's not like in the Constitution where nine states had to ratify in order for it to become the official document, governing document for the United States. In this particular period of time, every state had to ratify. So think about that. If you have one union where every state had to ratify and one union where every state did not, what was the status of the states, for example, that did not ratify the Constitution if they were not going to? Would they still be operating under the Articles of Confederation? Would they be independent republics? That's very important because... This was based off of Jefferson's language in the Declaration of Independence. These states were free and independent states. They were sovereign. They could do all the things that free and independent states may have right do, which included trade, commerce, war. And so when the United States became independent in 1776, and some of these states doing this on their own, they said they were equal to the state of Great Britain. And so this Articles of Confederation was simply a way to unify these 13 independent republics together. And, and when you look at the uh, Peace Treaty of 1783, the British granted all 13 states their independence. Not one unified conglomeration. It was all 13 states were granted their independence. The language explicitly stated that. So the Articles of Confederation was designed to have a union of 13 independent republics. As the language in the document itself says, this is a union between the states of, and they listed all 13 states. And that phrase, between the states of, is very important because that particular phrase also found its way into the United States Constitution. Nothing had changed. The union from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution was the same exact union. It's between the states of, and they listed the states. Now, in the Constitution, they don't list the states, they say between the states so ratifying the same. So it's only bonding on those states that ratified it. But even in that, it wasn't necessarily binding forever, as we'll see with the Articles of Confederation. So what kind of union are we going to have here? Again, it's a union of independent states. And these states had all the sovereignty. They would delegate, as we'll see in the language of this particular document, they would delegate some of their authority to the central government, but that didn't mean they lost it. Sovereignty cannot be abridged. Once you have it, you always have it. You can't give up sovereignty unless you say our sovereignty is no longer there. So in this particular case, as in the Constitution, they are delegating certain powers to the central government, powers that they think the central authority dealing in a union, a unified environment, would be better than individually. It'd be no different than if uh, you had a situation where you had authority 
and you delegated that authority, let's say it's your company or you're a teacher or something like that, and you have the authority, say, as a teacher to grade papers, well, you get, you delegate that authority to a teaching assistant. Or maybe to the students themselves, you have them exchange papers and they can grade the paper. But you still have the final say, because if you want to take that power back, you can at any time. That's a delegated power. And so the states, by delegating this power to the Union, did not give it up. And they didn't even give it up in the Constitution as well. Of course, the Tenth Amendment, we'll see, took care of that. But this Union, it's a Union of sovereign independent states. So here is one of the major problems that we have as we move forward in American constitutionalism. Each state had a Republican government. And during the period leading up to the American War for Independence, each state had its own colonial charter and its own constitution. This is what Patrick Henry was referring to, in part, when he talked about the ancient constitutions of their fathers. He was also talking about uh, the, the Magna Charta and the English Bill of Rights. But he's looking at these colonial constitutions and saying, okay, look, this is our constitution. And since 1607... We've been able to operate virtually independent of you, Great Britain, and now you're putting your thumb on us. And so the British model had long been the central authority, at least in terms of in, in relation to the empire. The central authority was able to regulate for the general welfare of the empire, but local concerns were to be taken care of by the local government. So whether you're talking about currency or taxes or even trade, or the legal system, all these things would become state issues, so or colonial issues. So here you have the basis for everything we'll be talking about moving forward. The local authority was seen as the better judge of the political and legal situation for the people of that particular state, because the central authority had no uh, way of knowing what was going on in Virginia or Massachusetts or New York or Pennsylvania. It was there for general concerns. It was a general government. And nothing is going to change when we get to the Constitution. These states uh, didn't change the nature of the state, and they didn't change the nature of the Union. That is the key to understanding everything when it comes to the Constitution, the nature of the Union. What kind of Union do we have? The Union has not changed, at least legally. We're still under the same Constitution that the Founders ratified in 1787 and 1788. Of course, the way the government operates is drastically different, as you're going to see as we move through this course. But the Union has not changed. So if we're going to hold politicians' feet to the fire, that's how you have to address it. Look, this is the Union that we have, and you need to follow that Union. Now, I've actually given you an image of the Articles of Confederation in a text. So we're going to go through some of the important parts of the Articles and look at some of the interesting components of the Articles, uh, because I think in the powers of the government of the Articles, because I think it's important to understand uh, how this government worked. So when we go to the Constitution, you can, you can compare and contrast, but not only that, you can see that at least in the way when this thing was being ratified, people were arguing for the Constitution. Uh, later on, not much had changed in their mind between the Articles and the Constitution. The Constitution had a little more power, but they were still talking about this union that they had formed under the Articles of Confederation. So, the Articles of Confederation, of course, is going to have a unicameral legislature, not a bicameral. That was one of the major changes that we had with, between the Articles and, and the uh, Constitution. There was no executive or judicial branch. The executive was simply the presiding officer of Congress. So they didn't have a separate executive, a king, or a president, or someone of that nature that the founders thought could cause all kinds of problems. It was just the presiding officer of Congress, and this rotated rather frequently. And there's no judicial branch because it wasn't necessary. All judicial concerns, the referee at this time, uh, was the Congress itself. That was the impartial observer. And it's important to note how they viewed these representatives uh, to the Congress. They were ambassadors. This is what John Adams called them. They were ambassadors from the 13 states. 
So it's almost like going to uh, what we might consider the United Nations today, right? I mean, it's it's you send ambassadors, they can pass resolutions, but those resolutions aren't binding. They never were. So the Congress could pass all kinds of resolutions. Okay, we're going to resolve to do this and resolve to do that, and the state should do this and the state should do that. But the states could look at it and say, eh, no, I don't think so. So these ambassadors had very little power. So this is a loose confederation of independent states, the style of which, and this is a direct quote, and I have it in the PowerPoint, was the United States of America. The style of this confederation was the United States of America. Nothing had changed when we get to the Constitution. The style was still the United States of America. These states united. In Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation, they expressly stated uh, how the powers were set up. State sovereignty was declared, the states were sovereign and independent, and all powers were expressly delegated. Now compare that to the Tenth Amendment. This is a really important uh, contrast here. In the Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution, all powers, are, which, all powers which are not delegated are reserved to the states of the people. That term expressly delegated was actually thrown around. Well, we should add it expressly delegated. It was, it was defeated because those who were against it said, look, it doesn't matter because that, that idea expressly is just implied. We all, know what it, we all know that delegated means expressly delegated, delegated. It's redundant. Of course, when this was proposed, everyone understood, well, if you don't say expressly delegated, then there's going to be some major problems here. But in the Articles of Confederation, that term expressly delegated was there. So all the powers were expressly delegated. This is the only things you could do. And that idea, of course, moves forward into the Constitution. These are the only things you can do in the Constitution. These are the only things you can do in the Articles of Confederation. Nothing had changed. There were no implied powers, expansive powers. None of that stuff existed in the Articles. And none of that stuff was really supposed to exist in the Constitution either. It's just that people like Hamilton and Marshall and others along the line decided that it was going to exist. But if you look at this transition from the Articles to the Constitution, nothing was supposed to change. Now, I keep saying that over and over because it's very important to realize that the Constitution was just supposed to be an enhancement of the Articles. As it says in the preamble, it's a more perfect union. And again, I'll talk about that when we get to the Constitution itself. In Article 3, you also have this General Welfare Clause. This is really interesting uh, because that General Welfare Clause, of course, will find itself in the Constitution. And if you look at American constitutionalism, that General Welfare Clause... Uh, moves forward uh, throughout time and, and how that thing is interpreted is very important. So the General Welfare Clause was this, gen this idea that the central authority would take care of the general welfare. What do they mean by that? Well, they meant commerce and defense. That's it. Commerce and defense. And if you look at the powers of the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, that's really what they're addressing. Commerce and defense. That's all. So everything else was left to the states. And so when we get to the Constitution, that phrase, the general welfare of the United States, is lifted directly from the Articles and placed in the Constitution itself in Article 1, um, Section 8. The powers of Congress. Nothing had changed. Roger Sherman is the one who lifted it, put it in there. And he said, well, look, this is what it means, commerce and defense. We all know that. It's the same thing that men in the British Empire. It's the same thing that men in the Articles. You don't need to read into this thing. There's nothing there. There's nothing there to read into. It just means that, look, we're going to take care of commerce and defense. All the things that go into that. And if you look at the powers of Congress, even under the Constitution, it's basically commerce and defense. All this other stuff that we've got, and when they talked about regulating commerce, they wanted to make sure that commerce was free because we have problems under the Articles and doing it. The first time that people were talking about, well, we have problems with the Articles, it was about commerce in that commerce was not free between the states. There were problems there, so they needed to address that, needed to fix it. I mean, you know, you had you had states levying tariffs against each other. You had you had the uh, prohibition of trade between states and currency problems and all kinds of issues in terms of commerce, facilitating commerce. So they needed some way to handle that. And of course, maybe you had problems on the frontier. So you know, with the Indian tribes, and you had high taxes in Massachusetts that caused a, a tax revolt and Shays Rebellion. So all these things were big issues. But again, it was commerce and defense. That's what they're looking at. That's all. Not all this other stuff. You know. You know housing and uh, health and human services and all these different things we finally get under the Constitution. None of that was even considered under the Articles and, of course, even under the original Constitution. 
Now each state had one vote. So each of the 13 states had one vote. And so these ambassadors to the states are going to be two to seven. The articles stipulate you can have two, so you use two, as many as seven. You pick, states pick. You know, everybody, guys, you want to send up here, uh, that's how many you can have. So each one of those states, though, only had one vote. And it actually took a two-thirds majority to get just about anything done. So you had to have a supermajority every time to pass any resolution, and that became very difficult. And the other problem, of course, is that states wouldn't often send representatives. They just wouldn't send anybody there. You know, they, they weren't compelled to do so. Uh, for example, when the uh, Congress was meeting in Annapolis, a lot of the northern states didn't want to send anybody to Annapolis because they thought it was too hot. It was a southern climate; they didn't like it. And even southern represent, excuse me, southern representatives talked about this. These soft northerners who wouldn't come into the South to uh, conduct business. So it wasn't. It wasn't compulsory. You didn't have to always, you didn't have to send people there. They did at times. So even when they sent them, business often didn't happen because it took so many states to get things going. Uh, the Congress really did nothing. And isn't that great? I mean, if you think about it now, we always think, oh, Congress should do something. Some of these people there and they sit around Washington, D.C. for almost a year and they think that they have to go there and pass legislation and do that. Be busybodies. Uh, these people didn't go and do anything. So there's no busy bodies there, because a lot of times there wasn't anybody there to have, to have any business itself. There wasn't a quorum. The Congress could not tax people directly or regulate trade uh, in the way we think of regulating trade. Uh, so the idea was, of course, to have some type of free commercial exchange, but the states, of course, could present blocks to that. And no taxing, no, I mean, not all. And you think about the time leading up to the American War for Independence, these are the big issues, right? The British are regulating trade in a way that the colonists don't think is, is uh, constitutional. And not just that, they're levying direct taxes on the colonies. And they say, you can't do this because we don't have any representation here. So here we have the central authority not having those powers under the Articles of Confederation. Not, again, they wanted to keep trade free as much as possible. But uh, they couldn't regulate in the way we think of it today. The Congress had to make formal requests to the states to raise troops or fund the Treasury. So if there was a war, the Congress had to say, hey, uh, New York, would you send us some troops? Uh, Virginia, would you send us some troops? We've got to fight this war. Well, of course, that makes it very difficult to wage war, doesn't it? You know, if the Congress today had to ask the state of Alabama or the state of California or the state of Massachusetts or whatever state you want to pick, you know, Michigan, Michigan or uh, North Dakota had to ask the states to raise troops, it might make w making war much more difficult. And war was difficult this time. We had frontier problems. You had uh, Indian tribes on the frontier, which were marauding up and down the frontier. And so we didn't have the ability, really, to have a, a major army go after these uh, tribes. We, we did. Uh, eventually, the United States did send the American Legion, what they called the American Legion, out there. And even on the articles, some of this was uh, being accomplished. But it was very difficult. And funding the Treasury was virtually impossible. The Congress could borrow money. They could spend money. So they borrowed it. But, uh, you know, funding the Treasury was difficult because they couldn't raise, they couldn't tax. So they had to ask the states for money. And sometimes the states said yes, and sometimes they said no. So the situation was actually flipped on its head. Now the states just go to the Congre Congress with their handouts saying, hey, look, can we get, you know, two or three billion dollars? We don't have enough to fund our Medicaid program. We don't have enough to fund our whatever program you're telling us we've got to have. So will you give us money? In this particular case, this, the Congress would say, well, look, we want to have this, this something we need to spend money on. Can, can we have it? And the states would say, no, nah, I don't think so. I mean, how refreshing. So these powers were limited. Congress had very limited power, which is why nobody ever thought they should go anyways and, and do any business with the Articles. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, of course. There's a distrust of a strong executive. They didn't want an American king. So when we get to the Constitution, you start looking at that executive branch and uh, how it was put together. This is one of the major debates in Philadelphia, and then, of course, also in the state ratifying conventions, about this person that they were going to have in the executive branch. What was that person going to be like? They all trusted George Washington. But who was going to come after George Washington? That was a real question. And how much power should this person have? Uh, should they have the unlimited power of a king? Should they have a veto power? Should they be able to have the power of the purse and the sword? I mean, what should they have? Well, in this particular case, under the Articles, they didn't want one. 
So that, that revolving door, the presiding officer of Congress, that particular situation, uh, presented a much more effective, they thought, means of controlling the executive. And if Congress had all this power, then uh, they didn't have to worry about some individual like a George III coming over here to America and causing all kinds of problems, raising havoc. Uh, the states already had Republican governments, so another level was deemed unnecessary. And that's very important. You know, we talk about this whole idea of the United States being a republic. Well, it wasn't a unitary republic like you had in France, for example. It was a federal republic. And there's a, there's a key difference to that. You know, nowadays we call the United States a republic. The United States singular, a republic, a unitary republic, but not really. Because we still have the state governments, which all have a republican form of government. In the Constitution itself, it said these states have to have a republican form of government. Well, why would they say that if they weren't concerned about state authority? That's, that's a key component to American constitutionalism. So we didn't have a unitary republic. We didn't have a unitary state. We had a United States. And each state had a republican form of government. Why have another one? Just, just another level of government that's you know, really kind of unnecessary. So we had these ambassadors going there, and it's, they do some business, but they don't do much. Uh, of course, um, <clears throat> this again goes back to the British model, local versus municipal, the local versus the municipal argument. So uh, in the British model, in the imperial period, even in Ireland and in the Bahamas, of course, in the American colonies, uh, those particular governments had a lot of autonomy. And Parliament, when you get to the 1760s, 1770s, and I talked about this in the last presentation, Parliament was trying to seize that power. They were trying to usurp it. And so as that power is usurped, the local authority says, you can't do that. Because for over a 100 years, you have not been doing that. And now you're taking it. That's centralization. It's what governments always try to do when you have a higher authority. They're always going to try to centralize power. That's the nature of government. If you look at the state level, the same thing happens. Now in the states, of course, your towns and your counties are incorporated by the state itself. So the model's top down at the state level. But when you look at the United States government, it's bottom up. And so the states delegate the power. The states delegate the authority. So the states in both directions have the power. They have the power of the, of the local municipal governments at the state level because they incorporate the cities and the counties. They charter them. But then they also gave power to the central authority at the top. So the states always the block. I mean, the, the states are central in everything. And I know a lot of people don't like the idea of the state, and you know, but you do have a little more control over your state government. And, uh, and the states were always there to conserve the culture of that particular area. And in today, it's no different. Uh, so the states are the key in everything when you start looking at American constitutionalism from the top down or the bottom up. And of course, many of the founders considered the states to be their country. That's how they called it. You know, Jefferson called Virginia his country. Massachusetts was Adam's country. They, they, they referenced the states that way. Some people actually went down to their plantation, like Nathaniel Macon. He said that was his country. He only checked his mail like once a month. That was his whole country. So you had the states as their country. These were their countrymen. That provincialism is saturates this founding period, and of course it, it moves forward uh, all the way into the 19th century. We don't have as much of this today. We don't have an attachment to our state. At least Americans don't as much. Uh, but they should, because if you look at business and, and uh, your, your uh, governmental concerns, that's where all the, that's where all the action takes place anyways. So, uh, and we all know the differences between the states. I mean, if you go from Alabama to uh, any other state, you're going to see that Alabamians are different from Connecticuters, for example, or uh, Californians, or, uh, you know, people from North Dakota or Colorado. We're all different. Different cultures, different local customs, things of that nature. So, the states still are very important. Now, <clears throat> um, Article 13 in the Articles of Confederation says that every state shall abide by the determ determination of the United States in Congress assembled on all questions which by this confederation are submitted to them. That's like their supremacy clause. 
Now, of course, the Supremacy Clause in the Constitution says that all laws and treaties made by the United States in pursuance of the Constitution are supreme. Well, here it is in the Articles of Confederation. Here's their Supremacy Clause. Every state shall abide by the determination of the United States and Congress assembled on all questions which by this Confederation are submitted to them. So, if we, if something is submitted to us and we pass it, well then, we're supreme in those areas. And the Articles of this uh, Confederation shall be inviolably observed by every state and the Union shall be perpetual. Now, that's that phrase. This is a perpetual Union. This is the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. Well, what does that mean? How perpetual is it? Does that phrase perpetual mean everlasting, forever? Well, if that's the case, well, then how can we even have the Constitution? And this actually was brought up, so I'm going to talk about that in one second. And I put this next part added an emphasis here. Nor shall any alteration at any time hereafter be made in any of them unless such alteration be agreed to in a Congress of the United States and be afterwards confirmed by the legislatures of every state. So when we get to the Constitution again, only nine states had to ratify. That meant that four of the states could be on their own. Well, that violates the Articles of Confederation. In the Articles of Confederation itself. So just this process by writing the Constitution and then ratifying the Constitution was illegal. At least that, even, that, that issue was even brought up. So essentially what's happening here when we get to the Constitution, you're seceding from the Constitution, from the Articles, and having this Constitution. At least that's how it's argued. I think you can look at it in two ways. You could say, well, they are seceding. I mean, look, the, the United States seceded from the British Empire. Then they had this governing document, the Articles of Confederation. Then uh, they have this Constitution. So in each process, there was a secession. They seceded from one governing document, formed another, seceded from that government document, formed another. So secession can be looked at in that particular way. Or you can look at it in the other way. As I said in the preamble to the Constitution, they were trying to form a more perfect union. And I think that's also important to note. So they go from the Union and the British Empire, because if you think about it, it was a union. The British flag is called the Union Jack. So that union of the British Empire, this larger conglomeration, you have the colonies in North America, Ireland, you know, Scotland, of course, England itself, that's a union. Very loose union in some ways, and as that central authority, that municipal government tried to seize authority, well, it was broken. Then you go to the Articles, which is a union of 13 independent states, free and independent states. And the state, the term state, of course, means something because these are not municipalities or counties or shires or provinces, they're states. Okay. Equal to the state of Great Britain. So then, then you go to this other union, and the union there was just to be more perfect to be a little better. So the nature of the Union, though, had not changed. The Union was still the same from here to here to here. So there's a secession. There's a break each time. And the important component of that secession, of course, is the convention system, which is very American because the people of the conventions decide what they're going to do. So the Constitution had to be ratified in convention, not by the legislatures, but in convention. So it's the people operating on this particular system. This is self-determination. So these conventions essentially were breaking away from the Articles and then going into the Constitution. The people of the states were deciding in convention. So that process is very important. So this was a secession. It was also the resumption of the Union as under the Articles of Confederation. So, did the Constitution destroy the perpetual Union? Well, all unions are supposed to be perpetual. Of course, we all know the contract can be broken. So when we start talking about this contract idea or compact idea as we move forward, we had a perpetual union. That compact was broken because the states decided they didn't want to be in that compact anymore, so they go to a different compact. There's no, and it, that's just self-determination. The question is, is the Constitution legal? And if they didn't follow the correct parameters of the Articles of Confederation, this was brought up. Well, look, we're not, we're not following the, we're not following what we're supposed to do under the Articles. So we've actually done this illegally. Again, this is where the convention system comes in. And if the convention says that we break from this, the people of that particular state, and the states, of course, ratified the Articles, and the states, of course, were primary, top down, bottom up, top down, bottom up, then the people can do that. That's self-determination. It's no different than when it happens actually in 1860 and 1861 in the South. The Southern Conventions 
decided they were not going to be any part of this constitution anymore. So they broke and formed their own constitution. No different. So secession really is the American tradition. That resistance to a strong central authority really is the American tradition. The states working as that hedge, whether it's top down or bottom up. Okay, so that's the Articles of Confederation. So understanding it, and I, and I encourage you to go out there and look at it. Look at the document itself, read the language, because you're going to see a lot of similarities between the Articles and the Constitution. Some of the phrases are lifted directly from it. And that union never changed. This whole idea of a federal union, at least in the way the Constitution was sold to the states, this never changed. And so that's an important part of the process as we move forward. Keep that in mind as we go forward. Go from the Articles of the Constitution. In the next presentation, you'll see me as when we're looking at the Constitution, we're talking about the Philadelphia Convention and ratification. So I'm going to mention this again. This is one of the recurring themes as we move in the course. Uh, it's only been distorted by the Supreme Court and by nationalists who wanted to say, well, no, you know, we really had a unitary state. Well, not really. I mean, we never had that. We've never had that from the beginning of the United States government. It's always been a union of independent states that expressly delegated their authority. And once you expressly delegate that authority, that sovereignty, and we'll address this again later, it, it doesn't go away. Okay, so once you have sovereignty, you can't get rid of it. All right, well, we'll see you next time, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it.